Good evening and namaste. Our learned speaker, Dr. Ravindya Dorakya, my friend, Dr. Rasananda Panda, who is a professor at MICA, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the 17th Dr. R. L. Sangvi Endowment AMA Annual Lecture on Economics with a very interesting topic that is the outlook of the Indian economy, prospects and challenge to be delivered by Dr. Ravinder Dhalakia, who is a renowned economist and from a professor at IIMA. Of course, I'll be introducing him. Uh, sir, we are truly honored to have you. And I remember when I first spoke to him, he was at USA, but at the, the same conversation, he very much agreed that uh, this time he would be back in India and, and deliver this talk, you know. Uh, this annual endowment lecture was instituted by a distinguished academician in the city, Dr. R.L. Sangvi, in 1997, incidentally also 25 years ago, um, by a very generous contribution of his retirement benefits. Imagine an academician who has worked all his life and giving you know, his retirement benefits to an institution for a very good cause. So we really acknowledge that. And very retired at, as a principal of HL College of Commerce, where he taught for 22 years, you know. And he was also a Fulbright scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, as some of them, you have been coming here, this is the fifth talk, you know, part of our five-day celebrations uh, where AMA is celebrating 25 years of this campus. AMA is actually, this is our 65th year, but for this campus, it's a 25 years. So that's why we're having this series of special talks. And uh, I talked about Dr. Sangvi, but we at AMA, we will always value Dr. Sangvi his generous and exemplary contribution for a very, very worthy cause. Uh, as you can see in the write-up distributed to you, each lecture in this series over the years, you know, so many RBI governance and very eminent uh, people have given the talks, you know, so th that is, list is mentioned over there, so I will not read all that to save the time. And even the detailed uh, biodata of Dr. Dholakya is there, but I'll briefly introduce him. Uh, Dr. Ravindya Dhurakya has experience of teaching, research, training, and consultancy for around 45 years, of which 33 years was at IIM Ahmedabad. And uh, prior to that, he was at the MS University of Baroda and also at the Sadar Patel uh, Institute of Economic Research, very much in Ahmedabad. And his areas of research uh, and interest are microeconomic policies, growth and development including agriculture, urbanization, labor productivity, health and education, national and subnational accounts. He has considerable practical experience of working on high powered policy making and evaluation bodies in India. There are so many of them but I'll name a few such as he was the member of the first Monetary Policy Committee of India, that's 2016 to 20 member of the 6th Central Pay Commission, that was in 2006 to 8, member of the High Level Committee on 10th Advisory Board of the CAG, that's currently 21 to 23, and so many others, all appointed by the Government of India. Similarly, several committees, you know, appointed by the Government of Gujarat. He was a member of the Expert Committee on Economic Revival Measures, including the Fiscal Restructuring, in the state economy post COVID-19, that was in 2020. And he has carried out numerous uh, consulting assignments in the private and public sector companies in India, and has uh, done work for the international organizations like WHO, UNICEF, the World Bank, United Nations Development Program, Havlet Foundation, um, United Nations, and so on. He has written about 49 monographs, 23 books, and more than 140 research papers published in journals of national and international repute. And uh, he's guided 41 students successfully for their doctoral degrees, quite an achievement. <laughs> uh, Dr. Dholavia has served as an independent director in many of the companies that include the National Commodity and Derivatives Exchange, Power Finance Corporation, State Trading Corporation, Air India, 
uh, Union Bank of India, Adani Ports and S Special Economic Zone, Adani Enterprises, uh, GSFC, G um, GSPC, and uh, very recently appointed on the central board of uh, on the RBI as a, as a member of the Board of Governors. So I will um, request my friend, uh, Dr. Panda, to welcome him with a bouquet of flowers. As some of you are aware, AMA has been doing different variety of activities over the years. And on Wednesday, when, when we completed uh, exactly 25 years, you know, there was a young boy, a teenager, who walked up and he, he's been coming to our, when he was a child for the summer workshops, then you attend the uh, wisdom weeks and so on. So he said he has written a poem on AMA. So I will intrude two minutes of your time because it's a touching thing coming from his heart. So I'd like to, I was touched. So allow me to read this poem by Rachit Bausar. He's a teenager. Who would have imagined two decades ago a candle lightened would illuminate the skies? It radiated and touched countless lives, expertise and education, divine and sublime. Be it management wisdom or lifelong skills or the magnificent AMA week, all in one blended unique, an institution, a class apart, sprawling classrooms and lecture halls, divinity radiating all around, thinkers and stalwarts assemble in one, Abode, abode of Saraswati blesses one and all. Tributes to the visionaries who envision decades ahead, a foundation that nurtures minds and hearts, walking and talking us along the head of time, an institution incredible, standing tall, leaving its footprints on the sands of time, ever. So thank you, Rachit. It's something from the heart, so I intrude it. And now I request Dr. Dolokia to please yeah, come. Thank you, sir. Divyesh Bhai, Prasnanda uh, Panda, and uh, friends in the audience, I am sure this will, uh, this is an occasion where, uh, you know, you expect uh, a very thorough academic type of a lecture <laughs> because it was basically instituted by a very distinguished academician. <laughs> And I do respect the academicians because I am myself an academician. <laughs> so therefore, uh, although the, the topic is absolutely practical and uh, absolutely having the implications about uh, the current affairs and future prospects of the Indian economy, <laughs> you may pardon me for some uh, subtle references to the, to the macroeconomic theories and macroeconomic framework, which is very important. I'll try to minimize those kind of things so that you know, I can communicate better to the audience. But that doesn't mean <laughs> that the foundations should be ignored. All these foundations are essentially very much ingrained in the pure theory of the macroeconomics as we learn and as we teach. Let me start straight away. I, in, incidentally, I intend to talk for about 40, 45 minutes <laughs> and then uh, be available for any question answers kind of a thing. Any interaction is fine. <laughs> so I'll, I'll confine my comments and my lectures. I intend to do that. <laughs> for 45 minutes or so. <laughs> but you know, I'm a professor basically, so the time limits are not sacrosanct in that sense of the term. It is only indicative. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, uh, 
if we say and if we talk about the outlook of any economy essentially the outlook would imply talking about four most fundamental parameters of the economy and these four parameters are <laughs> growth overall growth of gdp gdp is nothing but the value of the final products which include goods and services <laughs> but final products which are produced by using the scarce national resources within a given year <laughs> and that is the gdp so the growth of gdp that is the rate at which the gdp is likely to be growing is a very very important thing because it tells you what is the average rate at which the economic activities expand and that becomes a very critical element in the in assessing or analyzing the outlook for any economy so that is the first one the second important uh, thing and rather not only second second third and fourth <laughs> are essentially about the prices so when we talk about the growth we want to talk about the real growth that means we want to talk about the quantity of economic activity not the valuation per se <laughs> valuation becomes only a part of making that uh, entire uh, convert the entire quantity into a common denominator because you know quantities <laughs> would differ in terms of units and all that <laughs> that is the reason why we talk about the growth in quantities that means in real terms the second third and fourth parameters are essentially the prices basic and fundamental prices in the system what are the second thing the the second thing is the prices of products and therefore we talk about inflation so the second parameter is inflation which includes prices of numerous products and again it's an average concept at what rate the prices in the system are increasing or likely to increase the third important parameter again a price <laughs> is are the interest rates which is the price of the capital goods price of assets so therefore again the assessment of the outlook should be in terms of what is the likely behavior of interest rates over the period and the fourth most critical element is again the price and that is the exchange rate the exchange rate is the price of our own currency in terms of the foreign currencies alternatively we can always consider the exchange rate as a price of the foreign currency in terms of indian rupees which is what we usually talk about so the exchange rate by and large we talk about the dollar as a as a global currency <laughs> and there are good reasons for the doing that so dollar dollar's price in indian rupees these are the four critical elements when we talk about the outlook for any economy in the short run or in the long run now all the four things are very critical very important for the short run when it comes to the long run it is very important for us to understand that growth and inflation become very relevant for the long run uh, perspective but when it comes to interest rate and exchange rate it is not the interest and exchange rate which are directly connected with the long run kind of a perspective many people don't talk about long run exchange rates and non long run interest rates they do talk about the more fundamental factors namely the fiscal policy that is fiscal discipline which dictates the interest rates and you talk about the current account deficit which is known as the cad cad <laughs> for on the balance of payment for the exchange rate so these are the more fundamental forces now 
I, my, basically, my basic theme of the lecture is to talk about these four parameters in the long run and in the short run. I'll begin with the short run because short run is an immediate concern. Most of you and most of the market players that might be, I mean, sitting in the audience, those are the ones who will be concerned about what is our view and what is our perception, what is our analysis about the short-run prospects and short-run uh, outlook for the Indian economy. After doing that, I'll go to the long run. So the first and foremost thing is, in the short run, when we start talking about all the four parameters, let me, let me tackle them one by one. When you talk about the growth, let us be very clear. Right now, in fact, uh, only a couple of days back, on 31st of uh, August, the, the, the National Account Statistics Division of the National Statistical Office came out with the, the official estimates for the quarter one of the year 2022-23, that is current year. As such, it is quarter one of the current fiscal year. As such, it is known as quarter two of the calendar year 2022. Is it okay? So I'm talking about April to June. The, the number that, was, uh, that came out is 13.5% growth. 13.5% growth in real terms. That means don't, you disregard the inflation. At constant prices, you find out what is the growth. 13.5% is the growth which we clocked, the Indian economy clocked, according to the estimates released. I mean, this itself is a very high growth, and everybody should be really happy. <laughs> but for the RBI, <laughs> RBI will not be happy because <laughs> RBI had predicted and projected <laughs> a growth of 16.2% during the first uh, quarter. That means that actually the growth, real growth, in the first quarter is about 2.7 percentage points lower than what the RBI predicted. Estimate. It is, it is their, there is their projection, it is their uh, forecast. Now, they are talking about holding the, the, the overall forecast for the whole year, 22-23, at 7.2 percent. Just to put the things in perspective, the International Monetary Fund <laughs> and the World Bank, <laughs> when they give the forecast, they have forecasted 7.4 percent. RBI is already more conservative and it forecasted an overall growth rate of 7.2%. What has happened is that in the very first uh, quarter, their forecast has gone wrong, has been substantially less than what they have forecasted. Would that mean that they will revise the overall growth estimate downwards? If you go by the simple uh, calculation, they would revise it downwards by about 70 basis point. That means from 7.2, the growth, if nothing else changes, and if everything was the same thing, then they would come down to their growth forecast of 6.5 rather than 7.2. Now that is a big uh, difference. The stock market, is likely to react to these things. However, let us understand. The assumption is that we are assuming that after these numbers, which are out, people are only going to look at the numbers and keep assuming that the rest of the things are not going to change, which is an irrational kind of an assumption. Because there are some very good news in the first uh, in the estimates released 
during the first uh, quarter. The, the good news is that the consumption expenditure, private final consumption expenditure in the country, which was lagging behind, in fact, that was the concern of Reserve Bank of India and everybody, that the economy is actually recovering from the pandemic <laughs> and recovering from this shock. And there is, a, there is a sound recovery, but not very sure. People were uncertain about that, largely because the private final consumption expenditure was not showing an uptake. On the contrary, this figures show that private final consumption expenditures have drastically in improved and increased. As a proportion of the total national income, it used to be 55%. It has increased to 59 percentage points. Sir, so 4 percentage point increase, which means we, we are going back to the pre pandemic uh, kind of uh, the number. That is a great news. That means that con private final consumption expenditure is no longer a concern. People have started coming back to the market and markets are therefore actually booming. That concern is no longer a, a serious matter. Not only that, what is relevant is also that the investment uh, expenditures, the real capital uh, expenditures in the system, not only by government, government is doing excellent uh, kind of thing, they are, they are pumping in a lot of capital expenditures, that is fine. It used to be the case during the pandemic and thereafter. But the concern was that the private part was not picking up. That has also started showing a significant improvement. The, the investment expenditure has already shot up to something like 34%, which is again going back to the pre-pandemic level. Now, these two are the major components of the total GDP. The rest of the things, that means there are some bad news. Some of the sectors are not doing as well as uh, predicted by RBI or whatever. But these two are extremely important uh, development. Given the fact that RBI surveys show the latest surveys, okay, <laughs> you may be aware, you may not be aware, but let me tell you, the latest surveys show that the capacity utilization in the Indian economy <laughs> in general <laughs> has improved considerably and is hovering around 75 percentage points. 75 percent capacity utilization compared to the long term average, which is about 73 and a half percent. That means it is well above the long term average, okay? Which was not the fact earlier. That means capacity utilization has started improving and has gone above the long run average, which implies that there is definitely going to be an, an increased demand for investment expenditures. That means investment expenditures are likely to be revived significantly. If that is the kind of a thing, it's a very good news for the growth. Therefore, I would say, that actually, after the release of these estimates, you don't have to actually pull down your uh, long-term uh, estimate of some, something like 7.2% to 6.5%, not at all. <laughs> In fact, there is a likelihood that we may continue with the same type of a number, 7.2% or so, because for the remaining quarters, the estimates are likely to be higher because the growth is likely to pick up. That means that recovery is round the corner in a solid way and is going to be materialized into a higher growth. If that is the kind of a thing that is expected, it, it is, it's a, it's a very, very positive kind of a development, I would say. However, again, you know, the second uh, important matter is 
regarding the inflation. So I would just like to point out at this juncture that as per the official estimates given by the estimates means forecast given by the RBI in the latest monetary policy resolution, they have themselves recognized that quarter to quarter growth rate of GDP is actually on a decline. It is 16.2% to begin with. Thereafter, it is uh, falling down to 6 point something. Thereafter, it is falling down to 5 point something. And then finally, it is uh, going to come down to 4 point something in the last quarter. So over the year, <laughs> there is a definite kind of deceleration. Now, if the deceleration is uh, accepted by the Reserve Bank of India, that also is indicative of something. That means that they are expecting that the growth is not going to sustain in the same kind of a high number. It is likely to decline. On the whole, overall, average growth will turn out to be 7.2%. That is a very relevant matter for deciding about the inflation-oriented policy. Is it okay? So I just want to draw this attention. The growth assessment in terms of the other sectors, particularly agriculture, is an important aspect. And I would rather like to quickly say that in terms of the rainfalls, <laughs> the rainfall pattern during this year has been exceptionally good for us. In fact, better than last year. <laughs> last year itself was an overall better <laughs> thing. <laughs> but we are, we are experiencing so far the better rainfall than the last year. Our rainfall has been, on an average, about 7 percentage point above the long run average. This, this is an average uh, number. Several people are showing the concern that its geographical uh, distribution has not been satisfactory. Sir, that is a wrong way of doing. It is never going to be satisfactory in an ultimate sense. Out of 36 centers, you are never going to experience the complete uh, satisfactory thing of all the 36 getting covered. Last year, it was the seven districts which were lagging behind. Okay, less than the, the normal rainfall. They were deficient rainfalls. This year, it is only five. And none of the district is a no rain district. No rain center. That means, on the whole, the sowing is, net sowing has been progressing very well. Except for two crops, rice and adad, udad, as we call it. Okay? These are the only two crops where there is a lagging. Now, it's important to re know and realize that both these crops have the, the countering policies at the national level. Particularly, you find that rice, you have the stocks already there. And the stocks are more than sufficient to, to meet the, the shortfall. Therefore, actually, there is no such concern at all. And we should not forget that in terms of rice exports, we are number one in the world. We have recently achieved that uh, status. Number one rice exporters in the world. <laughs> Given all these matters, the concern are not so serious. There is a concern, but not so serious. Again, there is a good likelihood that whatever is the shortfall in the sowing and in the rainfall, is likely to be actually covered in the month of September. The forecast for the September is positive on this matter. Given all these things, agriculture is going to be performing much better. Therefore, I still have the view that probably the growth in terms of the short run outlook for the growth, we are likely to clock 7.2% in real terms. I'm not talking about inflation. I'm not talking about uh, the nominal growth. I'm talking about the real growth. 7.2 
is a very reasonable and, and respectable kind of a number. <clears throat> as far as the inflation is concerned, the second uh, important thing, <laughs> well, inflation should be measured by several uh, different uh, indicators and not just the CPI combined, which is the official target for the Monetary Policy Committee. We are not in the Monetary Policy Committee right now. We are talking about the overall outlook. Therefore, I am not only confining myself to the Consumer Price Index. I am also talking about the Consumer Price Index for the industrial workers. I am also talking about the, the Wholesale Price Index. And I am also concerned about the GDP deflator, which includes all different possible commodities and services put together. What the finance minister at the time of budget assumed about the GDP deflator was that it will be three and a half percent, which was a gross underestimation. Generally, the, the, the GDP deflator is a weighted average of the consumer price index and the wholesale price index with the weights of about 70% to the wholesale price index. These are all Walmart, I mean, you know, rounded figures. This is not an exact accurate thing. Conceptually, it needs to be understood that about 70% is the weight for the wholesale price index and about 30% is the weight for consumer price index. When you combine the two, you practically get the GDP deflator. If you have this kind of a thing, currently the, 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 the wholesale price index was in the, in the month before last was as high as 15%. It came down to something like 13%. It may further come down to something like 11% and so on and so forth. So the trajectory is well above 10%. Is it okay? For the wholesale price index. For the, for the CPI inflation, the consumer price index inflation, the, the numbers were 7.8% in the month prior to that. Now it was 7.1% and now actually in the month of uh, 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 the, the July, it turned out to be 6.7%. It is again on decline. But you can reasonably expect, reasonably expect that a weighted average of the two with 70% weight to I mean, wholesale price and 30% uh, weighted to the consumer price, you may turn out, you may end the year with about 8% as the inflation on GDP deflator overall. If it is the 8% inflation, hmm. sir, hmm. the nominal growth of GDP hmm. is most likely to cross 15.5%. I am sticking my neck out <laughs> by giving this number. 15.5% is likely to be exceeded in terms of nominal GDP growth. If the nominal GDP growth becomes 15.5%, it means that your tax revenues and the non-tax revenues are likely to exceed the budget estimates. You have already started seeing those things in the numbers. So we are not off the mark in expecting that this is likely to happen. Now don't get carried away by the usual media reports that this will imply that the fiscal discipline will be better. No. If the inflation has an has a impact on the increasing the revenues, so also inflation will have the impact on increasing the expenditure. So the impact, overall impact, net impact on the, on the deficit is likely to be much, much less. But it is going to be positive. It cannot be negative. Is it okay? That is at least uh, what, what does that mean? It means that <laughs> In terms of the next uh, parameter, the fiscal discipline, the fiscal deficit, we are likely to, I mean, you know, abide by the budgeted number of something like 6.44% in 
6.44 is the is the fiscal deficit number of the GDP which was given in the budget. I am quite hopeful that as of now, if you look at the outlook for the Indian economy, the fiscal deficit outlook is not likely to show any slippage, fiscal slippage. That means that the impact on the interest rates on account of the, the borrowing by the government and governments, not only one government, but the state governments also included, you are not likely to have any adverse impact on the interest rates. That means interest rates are likely to be then broadly governed by the monetary policy. Now if that is the kind of a thing, we need to understand what exactly are the, are the things happening. The monetary policy committee has front loaded most of the increases in the, in the policy rates the rapport rates have increased by something like 1.40 percentage points or 140 basis point, whatever you may understand better. They have already done that. Look at the transmission, sir. The transmission of this increase in the rapport rates to the bank lending and deposit rates have not been very satisfactory at all. The marginal cost of uh, lending, MCLR, of the banks have not been increasing proportionately. They are lagging behind. It's typically they are lagging behind. The, the worst thing is the deposit rates. Deposit rates are not showing the increase of even more than 20 to 30 basis points against 140 basis point increase. That means the usual expectations about the monetary policy, effectiveness of the monetary policy on the, the interest rates is actually coming true. That it, they, there, is, there is going to be a significant lag. Now, please note, that as far as the outlook uh, on the inflation is concerned, a very detailed modeling, a detailed data collection and detailed forecasting exercise carried out by the Reserve Bank of India shows that the inflation rate has already peaked in, uh, I mean 7.78 uh, uh, or something, that has already peaked. Thereafter, it is uh, falling and it, the falling trajectory is going to continue. It is going to continue till what? You are not going to cross, you are not going to cross the 7%, the, the, the I mean the 6% the, the mark till the end of December. But in the, in the next year, the first quarter of the next year or the last quarter of the current fiscal year, that is January to March, you are likely to have a, an inflation rate of 5.7, 5.6%. And the inflation projection for the first quarter of the next financial year, that is exactly after 12 months from now, okay? The inflation uh, forecast is only 5%. That means we are going to go back. 5% is, that means inflation will be reasonably under control, according to this thing. Sir, so this, this brings me to a very interesting and very important point. Most of the media experts and others have missed this matter. <laughs> so if you have been reading the analysis, <laughs> please ensure that you read, applying your mind also. <laughs> These things are missed. What is missed is that while everybody talks that the real interest rate in our country is negative, has been negative for a long period of time. My dear, that is no exception. We are no exception as compared to the world. No country in the world right now has a positive real interest rate. 
their interest rates are less than their inflation rate. But what is the duration? If I consider three months duration, that means if I consider the interest rate on the treasury bills, okay, three months treasury bills, then what I find is that the, the, in three months perspective, my real interest rate is negative. Because my current uh, inflation rate is 6.7%, likely to become 6.4 or something like that after three months, after uh, next quarter. On the other hand, the, the treasury bill uh, rate is only 5.6%, and therefore you are likely to have a negative uh, return, ne negative uh, real interest in the three months uh, perspective. But if I take the 12 month perspective, which is usually the case, then my interest rate is already positive in real terms. I have a real interest rate already because my inflation expectation is only 5% and my treasury bills, etc., is around 6 or more because it is a tenure for one year. Now, sir, this is a very significant matter that for three months you have a negative rate of interest, real rate of interest. For 12 months it is positive. Hmm. This is therefore the time in my opinion. Hmm. Again, it's my opinion, it's only my opinion, so don't take it anything any otherwise. Hmm. In my opinion, this is the time for Monetary Policy Committee to consider this aspect and pause. rather than continue the cycle of the rate increase. Because there is already a serious lag in the market for transmission. That means this is the time for the Monetary Policy Committee to take a pause, allow the transmission to really take place, and then take the action after some time, whether you need any further tightening. There is a scope for further tightening up to 25 basis point, I agree. But you need not exhaust that right at this juncture. This is an important matter because when you talk about the growth, sir, while the rest of the economy is bouncing back in a big way, what is not bouncing back are the small and micro enterprises. Only 50% of that is bouncing back. Those who could survive and sustain the pandemic, they are the ones who are bouncing back. But what about those enterprises, micro and, uh, and uh, small enterprises? which could not survive, which could not sustain themselves during the pandemic, well, they are still struggling to find the new niche. It is they who are in dire need for credit. And it is they who are now made to pay a much higher interest rate, interest cost. It is for them that you have to pause. <laughs> Sir, it is for them that the Monetary Policy Committee, if they have uh, these concerns, they should pause. This is my opinion. Please don't take it otherwise. <laughs> you know that I was the one who all the time <laughs> went on uh, <laughs> dissenting when I was a member there and people were trying to raise the rates. I was the one who went on dissenting at that time. Maybe if I were a member here, I would still have to be dissenting only. <laughs> but I mean, I don't know what is the, the entire thing for the monetary policy. But this is my assessment and my, my outlook for the country. When it comes to the exchange rate, because I have already talked about the, the interest rates, exchange rate 
is another very, very significant matter. Most of the guys are saying that since oil prices are becoming very, very, very strong, they are more than $100 a barrel, and you find that the prices of most of the commodities, right, the steel and other raw materials, are getting strengthened and getting tighter. We are basically facing a very serious kind of the current account deficit. Our current account deficit is a serious matter. I don't know what is serious, because serious is generally when the overall for the whole year, the current account deficit turns out to be more than 3%, we call it serious. Not on a month to month or week to week basis. <laughs> On a month-to-month -month basis, it could be more than 3%, it could be more than 4%, doesn't matter. But when on the whole, average out at uh, less than 3%, it is not a serious matter. It becomes a serious matter because your export growth is not picking up. If that is the case, yes, it is a serious thing because, you know, it might continue for some time. Fortunately for us, export growth is not that lagging. The only problem is we have to ensure that the exports continue to grow. So our real problem is with our exports. If the export starts picking up and growing, there is no difficulty at all as far as the current account is concerned. Fortunately for us, people are talking about the financing of deficits and our major problem was that because of the hegemony of the dollar, people are completely ignoring the fundamentals of American economy. There are a few guys here <laughs> who might be very well aware about what is happening to USA. <laughs> but somehow the market doesn't uh, pick up that and uh, show that thing at all. <laughs> the, U.S. economy is in a dire situation. It's a debt-ridden country, and their debt-GDP ratio is well above 110%. They are having all sorts of problems and all sorts of difficulties. Actually speaking, their economy is in recession. They don't want to accept this under the ex some or the other excuse, but they are all excuses. Technically speaking, if there are two consecutive uh, quarters when the growth is negative, <laughs> GDP growth is negative, it is called recession. And USA is formally in recession. USA is formally having a inflation rate of 8.5%, vis-a-vis 6.7% for the country, for our country. <laughs> Sir, the inflation differential for the first time or in the recent past has turned the other way around. Our inflation is lower, their inflation is higher. On the other hand, their, their uh, three months uh, treasury bill rate is only 2.5%. That means that they are having a serious kind of the negative real interest rate. Sir, so in spite of all this, the market has an expectation that Indian rupee will depreciate. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I know one thing for sure, that all these markets are basically working on the expectations. And don't ask me the question how the expectations are formed. Very often, the expectations are managed. <laughs> and when the expectations get managed, <laughs> it is called the speculation. <laughs> so in my opinion, this is not sustainable at all. <laughs> Powell has admitted formally that he is not likely to get back to the, their inflation targeting, formal inflation targeting of 2% in near future. 
for one year or more than one year, they are, they are not likely to return to that number at all. And therefore, frantically, out of sheer, you know, I, I would say the, the desperation, they are increasing the rate by leaps and bounds. 75 basis points, 75 basis points and things like that. <laughs> Sir, when there is a desperation about something, <laughs> it only shows that the fundamentals are extremely weak and people are not confident. If people are not confident, how can market be confident? I fail to understand that. I do believe that this is certainly not sustainable for a long time. The 79.50 or 60 pesa, the rate which is right now going on in the market, is not sustainable for a long time. You are likely to return back. In the short run at least, that means in the, in the, in the next few months, four or five months, I do expect that the rate might come back. Then again it might go up, again depending on the expectations and other things. But this is not sustainable. People are talking in terms of, on the other hand, that the rate will exceed the 80 to 85 and 90. I have my serious reservations on that. I differ. Okay, I, 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 you, can, you can take your own call, but I, I think this is not sustainable. Okay. This is as far as, uh, you know, the, the short run uh, kind of a thing is concerned. As far as the CAD is concerned, again, there are good uh, developments that we have now started the rupee trade. <laughs> and rupee trade means that the demand for dollars will be subdued. That is a very important thing. Therefore, I expect that rupee is likely to strengthen as we go down. <laughs> Similarly, very, very important kind of the, the, the shoots which have come up is, <laughs> that so far we were having a net outflow of dollars. The, the, the foreign, uh, in, uh, foreign in institutional uh, investors and foreign uh, direct investors were actually withdrawing. And as a result, we are having that problem. Fortunately, now for the last 15 days or so, and probably going to extend to next month or so, at least, at least, you are having a positive uh, inflow running in terms of billions of dollars. Not only because of the FPI and because of the FDI, they are turning positive anyway, but there is also the ECB, external commercial borrowings, because government has taken special steps. <laughs> Therefore, that flow is also positive. If that flow is positive, sir, there is no concern about how to finance the deficit. And therefore, there is no issue at all. <laughs> In my opinion, therefore, I still go by that, that I don't buy <laughs> the hypothesis and argument that the exchange rate is going to depreciate much more in the year, days to come, no. That is likely to be the other way around. There might be marginal tightening. There might, might be marginal appreciation of Indian rupee. Okay, that is likely to be the case. Now as far as the long run is concerned, I think uh, that is something which is a very significant uh, matter. In the long run, you will find that Basically, basically, the growth is driven by the savings and investment rate. The savings and investment rate, there is a very good news in the current uh, figures which are given, <laughs> that we have, we have probably bounced back to the pre-pandemic uh, era, and our uh, Investment rates are likely to be around 32, 33, 34 kind of percentages. If that continues, which is likely to continue, there is nothing to, to assume that it is not continue. If it is about 32 to 34 percent, the back on envelope calculation says that the growth in the long run, I'm long means 
something like five to 10 years. That is the kind of the, the, the term that we are having. Five years is called medium term, 10 years is about long term. So between five to 10 years, if the growth has to be forecasted, I would take the, the forecast based on the investment rate. Investment rate of something like 32 to 34 percent implies that we are likely to clock something like almost 8 percent, if not 8, then at least 7.5 7 percent rate of growth. The usual calculation is that it takes about 4 percent uh, of investment to result in 1 percent growth. So if that is the kind of, that is a technical term called ICOR, <laughs> it is the, the incremental capital output ratio, <laughs> which is uh, the one which we use generally, it is 4 is to 1. <laughs> if you are taking that kind of a thing, it works out to something close to 7.5 to 8 percent. Now if 7.5 to 8 percent is a real rate of growth, the inflation down the line is not likely to be much less. In fact, Shaktikan Das, the, the governor of Reserve Bank of India, is on record mentioning very recently in a lecture somewhere, he, he mentioned that we will take about two years to return back to the target of 4%. That is, inflation is falling. By the first quarter of the next year, it is likely to be 5% but it will take another year before it reaches the 4%. Now, again, I have a, a strong opinion on this based completely and back completely by my research. <laughs> I have done this kind of an exercise, thoroughly empirical ex uh, investigation and uh, a published paper on this. <laughs> I'm arguing that the threshold level of inflation for the economy with the given fiscal deficit and the current account deficit, because these are the two things which are very critical to determine what will be the threshold level of inflation. The threshold level of inflation given these two parameters in the Indian economy is in the range of 5.5% to 6%. Even when the target was being revised one year back, I was the one who very vehemently argued, of course, not necessarily listened to. After all, academics are uh, known to argue without getting listened to. But at least uh, somewhere, sometimes, we, we do have the, the, the fortune of impacting the decision. I'm in some way it has impacted, but let me tell you that at that point in time also I argued that our inflation target should be revised from 4% to at least 5.5% if not 6. It was not listened to. Because unless we do that, sir, we shall not be in a position to achieve 8% rate of growth. Because what is the threshold inflation? Threshold inflation is the rate of inflation above which it is detrimental to the growth. That is generally accepted. But the actual concept says that below which also it is detrimental to growth. That means if you unnecessarily tighten your target, when it is actually the 5.5%, instead of that, if you make it 4%, you sacrifice the growth. So my assessment about the Indian economy is in the long run, <laughs> that given the investment ratio and other things, we are having a potential of growing at the rate of 8%. We are having a potential. If the monetary policy and the fiscal policies mess up the matter, we shall not be able to get uh, 8%. If the inflation targeting is unduly fixed at 4%, and we are very, very, very particular about 4%, then we shall certainly not achieve 8%. We'll be able to achieve only something like 7% at best. 
at best, maybe less. It is up to us to take a decision. It is up to us to take a call. So if you are talking about the, the entire thing, that what is uh, my assessment and my, my entire uh, you know, outlook for the, for the Indian economy in the long run, I would say the potential exists that we can actually continue growing at 8% in real terms, plus about 5.5% to 6% in nominal uh, terms, that is, uh, plus additional nominal terms, which means that in nominal terms, our GDP can grow at the rate of something like 14, 14.5%. If we grow at the rate of 14, 14.5%, 5 trillion economy by 2027 is a given thing. $5 trillion. If by 2027 we become, we clock $5 trillion, and if you, if you believe in what uh, the, the <laughs> PM's Economic Advisory Council is talking about, in fact, they have released the report. And I, I will just take, a, take some time to really get into that detail. They are talking about that even if we clock only 7% real rate of growth, thereafter, we will reach $20 trillion economy by 2047. That is India at 100 years. India at 75 years is what we are right now. After 25 years, it will be 2047, exactly 100 years with the independence. By that time, we would have become 20 trillion economy, and we would be among the developed world, no longer a developing world. We would have reached there. I beg to differ. Developed world means a mature economy. Developed world means that you are a stagnant economy. We are not going to stagnate anyway. Forget about that part. We are going to remain dynamic our structural changes, our structural reforms, and our structural uh, things across the sector movement from withdrawal from agriculture and increase in the industry and in increase in the service sector, this is going to continue. It's not going to stop down. Similarly, ur rural to urban migration and urban areas are likely to continue and continue in a big way. Sir, this is not going to stop. We are at only 31% in 2011. The forecast which people are making, absolute conservative forecast, say that we will be about 44% uh, urbanized by 2047. I don't believe that. Because if you go by the exact uh, calculation, I'm, I'm talking about urban-rural divide because of the simple reason that when rural areas get converted into urban areas, it has a significant influence on the, the labor productivity, on the organization of the activities, and on the overall quality of the production and quality of the life. Sir, it's a development. So I, I, I beg to differ with this kind of forecast that 44%, no. If you just consider 31% is the total, uh, I mean, is the current uh, number. In 2011, we have already reached 31% urbanization. If you look at the number of villages which are having more than 5,000 uh, population, the total number of such villages become 21%. Even if you count, all those villages which fulfill all requirements formally for being considered as the urban areas, it is 12%. For some unknown reasons, they have not been considered as urban areas in 2011. So if you correct that mistake, if you correct that mistake, nothing more than that, just correct the mistake. The current uh, urbanization is more than 43%. And you have 11 to 21, 21 to 31, 31 to 41, and 47. Sir, my 
conservative estimate for urbanization, which is a relevant estimate for uh, calculating all this kind of growth potentials, etc., is 52% by 19 uh, by 2047. 52%. If that happens, the quality of labor changes and improves significantly. The quality of life will improve significantly. All that it requires is you invest in human development and human capital. You invest in building infrastructure and, and, and fulfilling the infrastructural gap. These are the challenges that we have to have. And the immediate challenge that you have to face is tackle the major menace created by the discoms. The state discoms, the distribution electricity companies, which are running into huge losses because they are unable to recover the payments from the customers. And that is creating problems on the banks. Now banks have been asked to, to blacklist them and take them as the non-performing assets. In order to do that, in order to escape that, the discoms are following the practice of diverting the funds to pay the bank. So officially they are no longer considered the non-performing assets, but from where are they diverting the funds? They are not paying the GENCOs, the generating companies. That means that the problem of non-viability <laughs> and the non-performance is shifted from the discoms to the GENCOs. And if the GENCOs stop doing this, then we are in a serious problem. So whatever I said <laughs> is qualified. Typically, like an academician, I would say, <laughs> I qualify all these things saying that we should be in a position to successfully address this major problem of the discoms and GENCOs. How can we do that? The states will have to step in. States will have to finance that. And from where the states are going to finance? By really disciplining themselves, fiscally and economically. This is the only way. <laughs> so these are the, some of the things which I consider as uh, my own views. I stop here. <laughs> I, I foresee, in short, a far superior kind of the, the future for the Indian economy. In fact, people say that it is not only the decade that belongs to India, it is the century that belongs to India. From now onwards, we are having that kind of a thing. It's not just the decade, but the century. And if there is the, if these numbers and everything is, is coming out true, believe me, by 2052, take this, by 2052, we are likely to cross the US economy in terms of market exchange GDP. <laughs> this is a very significant thing. We are talking about that the 5 trillion economy by 2027, 5 trillion can grow into the, the, the significant way in, in terms of crossing something like 28 trillion by 52. 2052, provided we discipline ourselves and we continue grow, growth at the rate of something like 7.5%. 7.5% is actually underperforming given our potential. That means I am, I, am, I am discounting our potential by the very fact that we are a vibrant economy a vibrant uh, democracy. 
After all, democracy has a cost. And I do consider the democratic cost of, democracy means the power to disagree and delay. <laughs> Given these two things, disagree and delay, that means decision will not be in a position to be implemented very, very right time. Given those kind of costs, still I believe that 2052, we can cross the US economy. And that would be a fantastic thing according to me. Thank you very much. We can take a few questions, please. The mics, please. Yeah, yeah, one by one. See that your questions are very short and crisp, please, huh? please. Sir, uh, don't you feel that uh, we lost on opportunities and growth in the past few decades? And my second question is like, you said that uh, small and uh, medium enterprises suffer due to credit, I mean, non-availability of credit and all. But our individual entrepreneurs are making a lot of profit with or without credit. So is it so that our economy is booming due to entrepreneurs and not industrialists? Thank you. Shall I take the, all the questions first, or uh, shall I go on responding? No, no, I think there are several questions. Otherwise, there will be a, then I'll together take it. Uh, so the, your, your, your basic question is that whether uh, the growth, just if you can repeat. Yeah. I mean, whether we lost on growth and opportunities from the past decades. And second is, is the economy booming due to industrialists or the entrepreneurs? I feel that it's booming due to entrepreneurs. That uh, you said that small and medium en enterprises are not uh, making profit due to, I mean, credit. But our individual entrepreneurs are making a lot of profit and they are booming also. Okay. So all the reason for that. Thank okay, you. So you'll take the next question first. Yeah. Start from my um, hi, I would also like to understand if uh, the role of eco and sustainability oriented industries and products are going to have an impact on how the economy grows. Like what kind of, because there's a lot of pressure globally as well as from citizens, right? So will that go about impacting how uh, the economy grows and will that replace? So sustainability. Yes. Uh, sir, my question is, can you explain the what is purchasing power, uh, 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 calculating GDP on purchasing power parity? Okay. Sir, uh, should uh, job growth not be an important aspect while discussing the outlook for Indian economy, as well as the quality of education and other things? Because we are just talking the numbers. I am not an economist from a layman. Side. I think he, he, uh, these uh, mind-blowing numbers are very good, but uh, for a layman, Indian economy does not mean the number, we also mean the people. So should that not be an important aspect while discussing the outlook for the Indian economy? Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you so much for a wonderful session. Sir, I want to know about which are the bases used to calculate GDP. For example, I say I get uh, out of 100, 20 marks. It's I say it's 20% in terms of percentage. So in says every year the government says 6%, 5%. So which are the bases used to calculate GDPs? Bases to calculate huh? GDP? Means if government says the 7% GDP rate, so how much is 100? Okay, okay. Oh. I'll, I'll, I'll come. Good evening, sir. Sir, uh, we don't have to consider the impact of uh, climate changes. Oh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Many leaders in India have said Many leaders in India have said in the past, who are the leaders in the economy also now, who are, I mean, holding the good positions. They said, we are the 
consumption consumption based uh, economy and we want to drive to uh, investment based strategy now developed countries have from last decade investment based strategy now what we should do are we on the right track do they think correct and uh, please tell us about the blue economy since we have large i mean uh, coastal area in india um, you happen to compare indian economy with the american economy by 2022 52 uh, india will surpass uh, uh, the american economy so at present india has a total fertility rate of 1.2.1 uh, 2.3 and by 2052 it might be less than 2 we will like 1.1 or 2 between that range the china is already facing that problem of uh, fertility rate the replacement rate uh, because of his policy or one time policy so how will you take that into consideration we heard the population growth and yes no okay. no total total fertility rate talking about total fertility rate okay okay can we just pause please because there are enough questions there i think with the time there is in time to take more please let him respond yeah yeah i'll i'll respond i'll go there go there okay yeah. Thank you for the questions. This is this only shows that uh, people are genuinely concerned about the the <laughs> the outlook and the future of the Indian economy. I'm very happy about this. In fact, uh, everyone should be concerned about that. <laughs> now, uh, you know, let me come very quickly to first of all the the straightforward questions, where what is the PPP GDP? That is purchasing power parity. GDP numbers. GDP of the two nations can be compared either in terms of the market exchange rate that you have, which is given in the market. I mean, every day, for instance, you are getting the exchange rate. You take an average for the whole year, and you say that this is the average exchange rate for the, for the, between the two countries, like say USA and India, the average exchange rate for the last year or so would be around 77, 78 rupees, okay? So what you do is, my, since dollar GDP remains dollar GDP, so I don't have to bother that. I have to adjust the Indian GDP, which is in Indian rupees. So Indian GDP in Indian rupees is say 232 trillion uh, rupees was the, was the GDP for the year uh, 2020-21, uh, sorry, 21-22. For the year 21-22, the GDP was 232 trillion rupees. During that period, the average uh, exchange rate of dollar to uh, rupee was around 74. Okay, around 74. I'm just quickly, I mean, back on the envelope kind of thing. Therefore, 232 divided by 74, if I do it, it will become something like 3.2 trillion dollars. Uh, that becomes the, the, the market value of the Indian GDP. And that is to be compared with the US GDP, which is around 17 trillion. Is it okay? So we are one-fifth, practically, or marginally more. Is it okay? This is the kind of the comparison. Now, very often people will say that this comparison is not correct because, you know, market exchange rate is dependent on only on the tradables and the commodities which are traded. <laughs> Those commodities which are not traded, <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of land, we have a lot of uh, other kind of uh, informal sectors and other things which produce many services and other things which are not uh, traded at all. <laughs> but they do contribute to the to the, to the living conditions of the people. So then I would say that, how do I compare? <laughs> then the question is that if I can see the basket of the goods and services that a typical household would consume, right, in India, what is the cost of consuming that? In rupees. And if I take the same basket, and ask the question, what is the cost of that basket 
in US dollars. Then ideally speaking, those the US dollars and the Indian rupees should be equated. Because that is what the, the rupee will uh, purchase in India and this is what the dollars will purchase in USA. Therefore, purchasing power parity, if I consider, that gives me the true picture. How do I compare? Now, when I do that kind of an exercise, it is not 74 rupees. Very often you find that that turns out to be one third or even uh, marginally less. That means that it might turn out to be something uh, close to, uh, I mean, I would say, 20 or 22 rupees or 25 rupees maximum. Is it okay? To a dollar. Then I have to divide 232 by 25 and not by 74. Is that clear? So that gives me the idea that roughly, roughly, the purchasing power parity number would be 10 trillion and not 3.2 trillion. Is it okay? Whereas US economy, US uh, GDP will remain the same, 17 trillion. But in terms of purchasing power parity, we are 10 trillion, not actually 3.2 trillion. I was therefore talking about in 2052, we will not cross the USA in terms of the purchasing power parity, we will cross them much earlier. <laughs> In terms of purchasing power parity, we have we will cross them much earlier. Something ar around uh, 2034 or 35, we will cross them. That is not what I am talking about, because people don't understand that. <laughs> people understand the market value, and I was talking about that in 2052 we will cross USA in market value. Okay, that is the first clarification. Okay. The second uh, important thing is regarding the entrepreneurs lost opportunities, I, I agree. I mean, come on, we have been uh, losing the opportunities day in and day out. <laughs> and I'm, when I talked about 8% rate of growth, please understand, I did not talk about the kind of uh, the great potentials that we have in our country, which we are flooring, which we are not utilizing, which we are not using, because of our wrong policies. Because there is a political issue and there is a, there is a significant kind of resistance. We are in a democracy. We have already created vested interests. It is extremely difficult to break those vested interests. Therefore, I did not even refer to that. <laughs> Otherwise, if you ask me the question, if we follow, say for instance, just one illustration, if we follow the vacant land tax, the prices of land, which are artificially so high in this country, will crash. And the moment they crash, the entrepreneurs, the small and uh, marginal entrepreneurs, will spring out. And the employment creation and job creation, what you were talking about, <laughs> sir, will automatically spur the whole thing. And the growth will not be just 8%, it could be 9, 10%, maybe more. But these are the dreams, which are irrational dreams. Because the practical people will tell you, this is not possible. In this country, we cannot introduce this kind of thing because we have already created a huge vested interest in this uh, country. And it will not be possible, just as the agricultural reforms will had to be taken back after introduction. Sir, this will happen like, this will be another one. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't bother about that. Okay. Then the question is sustainability of economic uh, and eco-friendly things. Are the sustainability the major concerns? Probably no. Because, if you look at our culture and our uh, things, we are far better uh, managing our uh, resources and everything as compared to the rest of the world. If we are talking about only our own sustainability and our own resource uh, utilization and our own eco-friendliness, then probably we are doing injustice to ourselves. 
we have to ensure that everybody else follows that. And if everybody else starts following that, we will have the, the comparative advantage. So I'm not bothered. So whatever applies to everybody will apply to us also. And in that case, if everybody is agreeing to that and if everything applies to everybody and it applies to us, then we are at a better place. So therefore, truly in an academic uh, exercise, I would ignore this matter. Academic exercise. Why am I ignoring? Because by bringing in that thing, I'm only strengthening my conclusions. It's a, it is called conservative analysis. Those things which are, which are favorable to my argument, I would try to underplay. Is it okay? I'm ignoring. All right. When it comes to job growth and other things, I did talk about that. But let us be very clear. When you talk about outlook, sir, unfortunately, outlook has to be in terms of numbers. Because outlook, otherwise, can be in terms of poems, which uh, he had read out in the earlier part. <laughs> sir, I am unfortunately not trained to do the poems. <laughs> so basically, I don't want to write essays and I don't want to go into the talk about that. That is left to the finance minister in the budget speech. First one and a half hours of her budget speech is always the poems and uh, the essays. <laughs> the real budget numbers come towards the end for 15 minutes. <laughs> so if you, have to, if you have to listen, listen the last 15 minutes of the budget speech, that will give you, that will summarize everything. <laughs> the rest of the time is a waste of time. <laughs> anyway, so I, I'm only trying to say that jobs and uh, the, the real facts and the real things, I mean, to a layman, please understand, I'm not here to talk about the outlook in terms of the, the sheer dreams. Sir, it is not a sheer dream. If it was a sheer dream, I can go on talking. It will not make any sense. It will not convince anybody. We must, as a, as a, as a social scientist, as an economist, we must talk about the things with supporting facts and figures. That was the, that was the reason why I did that. And as far as the job creation is concerned, the simple theory says that growth without job creation can happen only in one year, maybe one and a half years. Anything more than that, and I'm talking about the long term, 10 years and 15 years. Sir, you cannot have growth without creating jobs. Sorry. That means that the moment I talk about the growth, I am talking about jobs. Because without jobs, growth cannot take place. It's simple. Those guys who have been talking about the jobless growth are mismeasuring the, the employment. I'm very clear on that. Otherwise, jobless growth cannot occur for more than one or two years. It is not possible. Okay. Uh, what is growth of GDP? Because I think uh, there is some uh, confusion about this. You were talking about the base and all that. <laughs> My dear, growth of GDP, say, when I say 7%, 7% is on the base of 100. Today, if my GDP is 100 rupees, tomorrow, that is after one year, it is going to be 107. In real terms, in nominal terms, it will become 115. That is the kind of a thing. Because the 8 that you are adding, adding is because of the re revised valuation. Since it is a price factor, I do not consider that in the cal calculation of the quantitative growth. It is the quantitative growth that results in employment, not the valuation growth. It is for this reason that your question and your questions were, I mean, highly interrelated and connected. The real growth cannot take place without employment uh, generation over a longer period. That is the whole thing. 
Then the next question is climate change. Well, let me just tell you. <laughs> climate change is a wonderful uh, concept. And probably very few people will understand. I mean, we do experience and we do have uh, some idea about climate change. Everybody is talking about, look, the, the, the temperatures have uh, risen to something like 45 degrees uh, centigrade. A, a, among the highest kind of things. If you look at uh, when we were younger, uh, you and me, I mean, around, say something like five, 10 years back, the temperatures used to be around 42 degrees. So some two, two three degrees jump has uh, been experienced. But likewise, please understand, climate change also, uh, also leads to the rainfall. Look at the rainfall pattern, sir. What is happening? Actually, you find that whatever people are talking about climate change all over the globe, <laughs> some empirical thing, it is a you know, casual observations here and there, will suggest that climate change is actually helpful to the Indian economy. <laughs> we have been the beneficiaries. <laughs> so now the question is, <laughs> should we take measures to make sure that the things go back to the normal, <laughs> which we used to have? <laughs> Or should we, have, should we continue to have good monsoons? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I'm only trying to say climate change is a very important concern. We are all uh, concerned about it. And whatever measures are uh, taken at the national level, they are being uh, taken. I don't think they intervene or interfere. Because for the climate change uh, things, we again have a comparative advantage. If everybody is following the same thing, we are going to be having a comparative advantage. Again, for the sake of conservatism, I have ignored this matter, okay? <laughs> as far as the consumption-based and investment-based uh, growth strategies are concerned, I think when you made this uh, question, <laughs> let me just tell you that the that the developed countries never had the investment-oriented strategy, okay? They had, by and large, the consumption-based strategy. It is us who have been following the investment-based strategy. And we are going to continue following the investment-based strategy, but not ignoring the consumption because we don't want to create the inequalities. So consumption should be also emphasized simultaneously and that is the sense in which we are saying that when the, when the consumption as a, function, as a proportion of the GDP has increased from 55 to 59 percent, it is a good news because that means that the, the, that the recovery is broad-based because consumption basket is a, low, is a broad-based concept. So that is the sense in which it is consumption-based. Otherwise, we have been always talking about the high growth with investment base, and particularly within investment, the infrastructure investment. That is where we need to put at least 6% of our uh, GDP in the infrastructure investment. If we are doing that for about 10 years, 12 years, we will close the gap of infrastructure. Right now, we are having a serious gap on the infrastructure front. Is it okay? So that is the kind of the issue. And finally, the population growth. That was the last uh, question. <laughs> well, population growth <laughs> is, uh, is a very important matter. I'm not underplaying that at all. But you know that just less than uh, five, six months from now, <laughs> we are destined to become the most populous country in the world. 2023, we are officially going to be the most populous country in the world. We are going to cross China. <laughs> and that's a fact that our net fertility rate is probably getting below <laughs> the reproductive uh, kind of the population. As a result, we are likely to experience the same problems, similar problems to the, that the other countries in the world have already faced. But fortunately for us, 
the dynamics, demographic dynamics are completely in our favor as of now. And it is going to be in our favor till 2045 officially. And if you extend it today, whatever we have the situation today, 2022, and if I consider that to be the case, then we are going to have experienced that up to 2055. They are not my estimates, they are the UN estimates. Okay? That means the demographic dividend that we are talking about. What is demographic dividend? The demographic dividend is the working age population as a proportion of the total population. That is going to be increasing in India and therefore the dependency rate, the population not working as a proportion of the total population is going to be falling till 2045. And why this is happening? Because we have 30 states. We have a large landscape. Some of the states have already crossed that place, but several others <laughs> are yet to do that. <laughs> that means that as a, as a nation, we are likely to have that entire thing up to 2045. And as compared to today's situation, we will receive, we will get back to that situation again. That will take 2055. Fortunately, fortunately, that is the time when we would have crossed the US in terms of the, the market exchange rate GDP. <laughs> that is our GDP will be higher than the US. Okay? We may not still cross China by that time, but then we will be number two. <laughs> Don't lose heart. <laughs> if we extend those things by another 10, 15 years, will also be able to cross China. <laughs> that means we will regain our glory <laughs> of being number one economy in the world, which we had lost, which we had lost out <laughs> in a significant way for the last 800 years or so. Around that 1200,000 AC, 1200 AD, we were number one in the world. <laughs> so we will regain that uh, entire thing before the century turns. It is therefore I said, this century, not just the decade, but the century belongs to India. Thank you very much. Yeah, I request the audience to be present for five minutes. Yeah, not more than four to five minutes I will take. Uh, to start with, uh, what is scintillating lecture? You have, uh, uh, sir, you have covered from the, you know, basic fundamentals of macroeconomics to the current context to what is going to be an immediate uh, future to the long and also in the during question answer, you connect to the history. So, you know, that reminded me of all the sessions and interaction that I used to have with you, sir, during my IMA days when I was working with you as a research assistant long back, you know, 20 years back. Now, that's the quick summary of the session, and now I have the you know privilege to put up a vote of thanks to you know to the audience and to the speaker, Professor Dolake sir. Now, first, I request all of you there is a feedback form, so please fill it up. This will help us in getting uh, the how to uh, organize the sessions, improve upon that. So please fill up the feedback form. And as a vote of thanks, we are all grateful to audience for their patience and of course the question answering which always you know makes the session more lively and you have seen how during the question answer and sir, sir has gone to the history take you to the some of the uh, you know futuristic part and put up a outlook in front of us befitting to the title of the session outlook of the Indian economy prospects and challenges so we are in 2022 we saw a outlook till 2052 and we came back to the you know, that Sarah said, a century for India. Now next, of course, to Radia Sir and AMA for organizing such kind of uh, sessions over so many years, and 
to RL Singh Bhi Family and Foundation for uh, you know uh, organizing this event and sponsoring the event. Definitely, we are grat grateful to the members in the press for their generous coverage over the years, and of course to all the stakeholders of AMA for their continuous support over the years. Now, with these words, I will request uh, Radia Sahab to present a memento to Dhalakya sir. Thank you very much. We end the session.